All right, we'll start as soon as John shows up. Uh, I'm always uh, early as on time, on time as late, late as unforgivable kind of guy. I got that drilled into me from marching band. This one time at band camp. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, they came out after I was in school. But anyway. Uh, hey, John. All right, we're almost there. All right. Nathan, is that your actual name? <laughs> my actual first name, and unfortunately, I have to include it for those who just see my first name because they only have a blank that says, what's your first name as opposed to what do you go by? <laughs> Well, fair enough, but I've seen you transpose your letters on, on, on LinkedIn versus Facebook. And I'm like, I don't know. I know who you are, but I'm like, <laughs> I get mixed up times. Glad to have you on. Thank you. Interestingly, on the last call, I finally figured out how to fix it for that for that particular call. So I actually removed it. I'm pretty impressed. We got a pretty good turnout here. And I'll post the link again. And John's waiting for his PC to boot up, but he'll so he'll be here momentarily. But uh, that won't be too bad. Wow. Tuning everybody out. So I was like, well, well wrong. okay, I'll make that work better. Uh, there we go. We're going to have well, I can't hit reply. How odd. Okay. Oh. Uh, such as career agent computers. It says Mass Mutual sent a download last night, unawares to everyone. He'll be on shortly. Oh, boy. Scan it before you run it. Uh, it comes from Mass Mutual. So, you know, if you're going to lay the blame, at least it's a company that has some money, they can fix everything. Oh, thank you, Jane. I appreciate that. Thank you. I didn't mean to have this scheduled on my birthday. It just happened to be. So <laughs> we should all sing happy birthday in our worst voice. No, you shouldn't. And that'll be my pre your present to me to spare my hearing from that. Oh, I can get bad. I, I can know. Get, I can get bad. You're singing and... as bad as your Spanish. <laughs> Comer <laughs> Esther Usti. And the one and the two. This is being recorded and it will be used against you. Okay. I hear you.
I think Tom's in the lead. He showed up on time and wore a tie. Today was a big day for me. I, I have to pretend <laughs> that I know something. So I, I'm letting the outfit speak. I, I let the certificates do that for me, too. So. There you go. And, and see my certificate? <laughs> yeah, shut up. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm looking forward to my NBA too. You know, massive bank account. Yes. You see me now, David? I do see you now. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> Well, you're going to go in the witness protection program again, right? Okay. David, I don't know if this is allowed. This is Barry Rutten, but since we're waiting for uh, John's uh, Bill Gates fake computer to boot up, um, <laughs> maybe Mr. Love could share just his one or two minute spiel on where he thinks Ohio National is at, going somewhere, dead in the water, just rather than staring at my computer. I'm all well, for that. I will even hit, I will pause recording if you feel uh, more inclined. Well, but if you're streaming live, it doesn't matter. At this point, um, the, the, the thing that, that is um, exciting for me is the announcement they made two days ago that the proxies are going out very soon and that loans, current loan activity on an existing contract will not affect its buyout purchase amount. So that, that's what I was looking for. As far as the amount, I don't know, still won't tell us. They're making it real difficult for us to find out. Um, I'm just not impressed. And uh, so that was part of the part where I didn't even look at the announcement, I got the email, but that the next step it has been approved for the acquisition or whatever. And yeah, you said the proxies are going out for the, for the voting and we'll go from there, so. Now that's on the website. So if you still have access to getting on the website, it's the top blurb updating on the buyout. Yeah, I still have that. So, okay. okay. All right, John, did you join us without me realizing it? I'm just kind of doing a verbal check here. Well, what we, well, I hate that <laughs> anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Um, does everybody know that my grandmother's name was Karma? My dog's name was Murphy. So, uh, you know, I've got it on both sides. Uh, Kurt, imagine we have no video, but it's you on audio. Uh, we can see you. Good to be here. Okay, cool. Okay, okay. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. I hate waiting. Okay. And Terrence. <laughs> yes, Terrence, glad to see you. <laughs> I had to buy my own laptop when I was at Mass Mutual. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, if anything, this is a lesson. Keep all your updates up. I don't know, but just avoid Windows 11, at least for a while. <laughs> yes, Barry, I'm sure he could afford his own laptop. 
Um, okay. Well, you know, I hate, I just hate waiting. I'd rather get started with part of our agenda, and we can circle back uh, in a moment. But anyway, I'll, you know, because we're about ten minutes in, so I know I want to welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really excited for the participation. And we were thinking about, I was thinking about this a couple months ago that, well, we've got all these great group experts. How can we increase our involvement, increase the knowledge given to the group? And one of the topics that came to my mind was, um, was selling systems and the history of the different selling systems, how they came about, um, our experiences uh, with them. And John is, a, is the kind of guy, he's got a lot of opinions and I'll, and I'll love to mention his introduction once he gets here. Um, but I'm, I was going to start off talking about leap systems. So that they're kind of like the, um, the granddaddy of all of them. And then everything seems to be a variation from that. Um, and so when John gets on, we'll talk about leap systems, because I know that he's met with Bob Castellone, learned a lot from him from under his tutelage. But maybe we can skip ahead tom tom when i first heard you speak and i know you mentioned this at many of, of your um events you've talked about your experience that you started at john hancock and then uh, when you left based on certain events then you went to ohio national and then you met don blanton and of course don is the founder of money tracks and circle of wealth which is admittedly an offshoot of leap yet you know, and by the way, I remember when I had my leap system, everybody said anything that's not leap is leap light and means that, you know, it's not good enough, whatever, go to the original. But I've learned, and when I saw your presentation the first time 12 years ago, I was like, wow, there must be something to this because you're able to communicate so quickly and so effectively. So maybe we can start at that point and we'll circle back when, when John comes on in um, and you can share your experience with, with Don and things like that. Okay. Um, well, first, Thanks for having me, David. I think this is this is awesome. Um, allowing the experts in the group to have some time to share, I think, is is great. Um, I, I wish when I started my career almost 50 years ago, I would have taken advantage of listening to some of the old guard <clears throat> share their thoughts. Because back then there wasn't the interweb, there wasn't social media. It was you know you had to pay and, and go visit someone. Um, it's interesting. When I when I go around the country and I speak talking about my presentation and what I actually how I communicate with people I get I get those two people up, come up to me afterwards the circle of wealth and then the leaper the circle of wealth guy will come up to me and say you know I, I bought the software I have the system there's 94 drop down boxes I don't know where the sale is and then I get the leap guy that comes up to me and says in 45 minutes you are where I would have been on the seventh appointment. So, and, and why I'm here is, is I'm, not, I'm not here promoting one selling system over another. I am not saying any selling system is better than another. I, I just want to caution everyone that a selling system is a process. And what I have found in my career is that it, I, I want to rename my company the Infinite Circle of Leapstone because I have nothing original in my conversation, nothing. Nothing I say has been thought of by me. How I say it, when I say it, and to whom I share it is completely all about me. But when we talk about those things that excite people, you have to have a track to run on. And when I first met Don Blanton, um, I'm, I, I, I came, went to the home office after two months with this company, I sat in the back. I'm thinking, you know, I've been here too long. If I don't like the presenter, I'm going to get up and walk out. And the first thing he said when I sat down was, and it wasn't directed at me, but boy, I sure as heck heard him. If what you thought was true about your money turned out to not be true, when would you want to know? And of course, we all chuckled, exactly like Cynthia just did. Yeah, we chuckled. And then he came back and he said, I'm serious. When, if your client were to discover that what you're sharing with them isn't going to work the way that you planned. When do you think they want to hear from you? And I went, oh crap, now I have to listen. I have to not only stay here, I have to take copious notes for the next day and a half because this made sense. Now, I, I lived in Northern Michigan at the time and from Cincinnati to Northern Michigan was a seven hour drive. 
And on that Friday afternoon, when we said meeting's over, I called six clients. And I said, I just heard something that blew me away. I'd like to stop by and get your opinion. And I shared, obviously, a very rough idea of what I have mastered as of today. But I had a premium commitment of over a quarter of a million dollars on seven appointments. And I had never turned on the software. I had no idea what the product looked like. So if you think that the selling system is going to sell the product, don't. Keep your money in your pocket. It's not going to work. If you think that the selling system will help you with a process so that you can explain the product, why you think it's advantageous, then buy every selling system known to man. And do what I did. Steal from everything that makes sense for you. There isn't one specific process that's going to make you more successful than another. And again, I'm a hybrid. So I look at everything that was ever met or presented by man and stole those things out of it that made sense to me. I think one of the biggest fallacies in our industry is that we're taught by lawyers to sell the company's product the way the company wants us to sell their product. You've got to learn the vernacular. You've got to make sure that you talk features and benefits to satisfy who? Them. And by the way, you're not selling to them. You're selling to the public who don't want to hear that kind of stuff. So when I teach what I teach, I give permission to agents, probably for the first time in their adult life, it's okay to fire somebody. Stop being everything to everyone stand true to what you believe. And if you begin your conversations with, this is what I believe, this is why I believe it, this is to whom I wish to share it, would you like to be a participant? All you're going to do is attract people who want to do what you want to do. I am out of the convincing game, the chasing game, and selling systems have a tendency to prove what people maybe don't want to be having or have proven. Life insurance is the most flexible, wonderful financial product ever invented by man. The way we as an industry explain it is pathetic, pathetic, because we think the process, we think the, the software, we think the spreadsheet is going to sell insurance. God, the minute they can figure out those lawyers at the home office, the minute they can figure out you aren't needed, your commission is going to be a dollar, a dollar. And that's going to be the pay, to pay the postage to go out and get the application. So thank God this is a complicated industry. Thank God those who will spend time on getting better themselves will achieve success. And everybody else is going to eke out a living. I don't want to eke out in living. I want to own the living. I want to, I want to dictate what's going to happen. I don't want to be the result of what will not happen. So my, my, only, my only suggestion all of them are good, all of them. There isn't a horrible selling system. But before you figure out the selling system, you better figure out who you are and why you're in this business. Because if you can't quantify that, the selling system is not gonna make the sale for you. Amen to that. Um, I remember my first few months at a large mutual company um, hey, I'll say it, Mass Mutual, there's a whole bunch of agencies, so it doesn't matter. Um, I won't identify which one. And um, before that, I had done some of my own research, due diligence, realized, oh, there's this thing called Leap out there, and I heard good things. Of course, everyone was so tight-lipped about it. No one would share what it was. Um, and so I joined with this agency, and I, I put together a business plan, and I showed it to people, and they said, you know, the, the general agent, the couple of sales managers, and said, you can do all this with Leap. I'm like, great. How does that work? Well, we can't tell you. <laughs> it was so tight-lipped based on the licensing thing. I'm like, look, I'm no dummy. I already have my 7, my 66, my insurance. I already have my CHFC. I'm like, you can tell me what it is. Like, no, there's other stuff. Like, fine. But the it just sounded more like a the way it was talked about was more like it was a magic pill. It was like, well... You know, uh, if top producers would say, look, my, my income tripled using this. I'm like, okay, that's great. But how do you use it? How do you get appointments with it? How do you 
do all these things. And so I got started with it. It was and the thing I think about these selling systems that it's not just a way to present life insurance to the public, but it's a learning track for the agent to learn all these things that even though I got the alphabet soup after my name, I didn't learn all that stuff from there. I learned it from these selling systems. I get a lot more usable knowledge from learning from other people and selling systems than I did in designation studies. Um which is kind of unfortunate, but been my experience anyway. Um, John has still not come on. That laptop, I swear, he needs to take it out and shoot it. Um, David, why don't, we, why don't we open it up to people if they have any questions? I'm good with that. Yeah, are, any questions uh, of any kind? Um, just about. I, I can't think of that there'd be a dumb one. Uh, please. Uh, uh, there's a question. Will recording this be available? Yes, there will be. I will post it to my YouTube channel. Um, and I'll post a link in the in the various groups I'm in. Yeah. David, I'm here now. I had a sign on through my iPhone. I'm sorry. Oh well, hey John. Okay, well, yeah. um, I wish we could see you, but I'm I'm glad. That, okay, and I yeah. always call you John, and I always screw up your last name, but, but you know that that's kind of common for you. <laughs> yeah, that is common. It is Ouija. It's pronounced Ouija. It's Polish, which is not uncommon in Chicago. In Polish, it's pronounced Achveja. Now, here's the punchline: it uh, it means fat, strong man. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. Well, my last name means child, but if you read it backwards, it's Redneck. So you know, whatever. Okay. <laughs> well, let me introduce John because uh, you know, John, you know, and, and he just sent this to me. You're a 26 year veteran within the insurance industry. 20. Um, Okay, you gave me a, a sad smiley face there. Yeah, it, it, it was it was a typo. Twenty top of the table qualifications. T and T turns into that cry emoji. But yeah, twenty top of the table qualifications. Twenty three MDRT, Mass Mutual Hall of Fame. Um, you have a bachelor's in philosophy. Wow. Okay, that should be interesting. Uh, your MBA from USC, and of course you have the alphabet soup as I do. You have CLU, CHFC, RICP, and AEP, which is a high end uh, estate planning credential. Yeah. Um, so awesome, glad to have you. And you know, one thing Thank I you. know with your with our interaction, you have some very strong opinions, and I love that. Um, <laughs> You also you tend to be just a tad bit abrasive, so I got to soften up just a tad. But I love I'm it. I'm gonna uh, be nice. I'm gonna be nice. The, the 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 presence on the internet is not the real person. I just like to you know bust balls. Okay, fair enough. I'm great with that. Um, John, um, when I was thinking about putting this presentation together, we already heard from Tom and, and his experience with Circle of Wealth and Don Blanton. But before <laughs> there was that, I mean, the granddaddy of this was Leap Systems yep. and. Personally, I believe, and I can't prove this, I believe that what Bob Castellone did was took John Savage's circles, made them squares, added more squares, and then turned it into a system. That's uh, not entirely accurate, though. There is certainly a little bit of Savage in there because uh, Bob and Savage, you know, were contemporaries. But, uh, you know, in the early part of my career, I got to be very close with with Bob and Bob Ball and Vince Dodona and the whole inner sanctum of Leap. And there was a, there was a Leap school that Bob did uh, that was private invite only, uh, I don't know, probably about 11 or 12 years ago now. And he gave the, he gave the, um, the genesis of all of that. He was a struggling agent and, you know, he, certainly took a uh, he certainly though he'd probably never admitted publicly to this day took his you know lead from savage and distinguished um financial products according to protection savings and growth and the first generation of leap was merely explaining permanent life insurance within the context of protection savings and growth the math came much later. In fact, it was Todd Langford and um, Norm Baker that made most of the advancements in that world when they developed the first Leap software, unawares to Bob. Um, I have a collection of life insurance sales ephemera going all the way back to the 1920s. And 
the the first generation of leap that he sold in the 80s to insurance companies was indeed the PSNG model. And the way the model was designed was that the most powerful drawers were always down into the right. They were the bottom right. So you had life insurance, you had tax deductible qualified plans, and you had tax shelters when tax shelters were in vogue in the 80s. And there was basic math to those worksheets, um, which I, I never used. I saw them because we had them in the agency left over from years and years. But I, I wouldn't entirely characterize it all as a process of John Savage. Bob did have some and, and still does have some pretty profound influence on the industry. Probably the biggest um, misnomer about the entire LEAP system, and I could talk openly about this, inside of WBC, we refer to it as Brand X, uh, somewhat self-deprecatingly and then also for legal purposes, but now we're beyond all that. Um, when Bob came out with the person A, person B concept, that's what really created a lot of problems. Person A, person B, your man A, man B, was designed to defeat an objection. And that objection was, well, I'm dead. I don't want to make my, I don't want to make my, my wife and my children, you know, rich. You know, I just want to take care of them. So the answer to that question was, well, properly structured, properly owned, and matched with savings and growth, you can benefit from your death benefit by monetizing your remaining assets equal to or less than the amount of death benefit. That was probably missed, I would say, in given my 10 years as a LEAP trainer, um, that was probably missed by 99.9% .9 of all attendees. And the person A, person B calculator actually became a plan. And the person A, person B calculator, which I assume most of the people on the call are familiar with, is fuzzy math at best. Ooh. It can't be replicated in reality because it doesn't account for variance. It's a straight line progression. In fact, Jason Sanger and I wrote a presentation that we've held back for years um, that completely debunks that drawdown mentality or that drawdown method. You just can't do it because as we all know, and this is a fairly enlightened group, there is a big distinction between your average rate of return and your actual rate of return. Yes. And there is a big distinction between your accumulation phase in life and your distribution phase in life. During your distribution phase in life, you've got to take your money before you know the rate of return on your money. An average is fine, borrowing from Art and Jason, going up the mountain. An average is absolutely devastating going down the mountain yes. because there's just simply no more new money coming in. So I'm, 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 I'm hypercritical of leap now. Um, and I built my, and I built my practice on it, but I am hypercritical of it because I would say, and I could say this in this group, I would even say it publicly at this point, <laughs> those of us who are trainers, we made a horrible, horrible mistake with leap. We never focused on, we spent so much time selling the life insurance. We did it at the expense of savings and growth type assets. Wow. Um, yeah, and, I, I remember from my first year and my only year with Leap. Um, and by the way, one thing about the selling systems that you're not just given the software, you are part of the community, you get to be yeah. involved with things. And that, that was great because I remember hearing, you know, Bob Castle and give his Monday morning rants. Um, yep. which was <laughs> um, I do those I, for Mass Mutual, uh, you know, once a week, so I get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing is, uh, if, and if people on the call are not familiar, from what I recall, and I think the whole point of how, what the end game of Leap was, was what we call the permission slip spend down strategy, which was, yeah. 
you now have this permanent death benefit, but you have all these other assets that you can now spend at an accelerated rate because you have the life insurance that will replace it upon the death of the first spouse or second spouse, however it all uh, goes together. Mm -hmm. um, oh, sorry, John, did I have that just about right? Yeah, no, no, yeah. I was saying, and it's too esoteric of a concept for consumers to understand. The marketplace has changed. We as advisors are completely commoditized with our products and even our approaches. You know, when yeah. Jamie Dimon gets on Market Watch and says at JP Morgan, we can afford to give away money management for free, that bothers me. When Goldman Sachs acquires United Capital and starts moving into the mass affluent market, uh, which is the bread and butter of the life insurance companies, that's something we have to be afraid of. And even more, more now than ever, a, one, and one thing Bob said that was great, I quote all the time, a sound philosophy and a step-by-step -step system that follows a narrative is more important now than ever before, because that's what keeps us from being commoditized. Amen to that. Yes. Um, and we all have our own different ways of learning how to cultivate that from ourselves and to tie into that philosophy, uh, whatever that philosophy is going to be. And we'll, we'll touch on that because uh, I think you and, and Tom are going to have similar yet definitely different philosophies. Um, <laughs> and we're not going to get into I like Tom. Forward, I, 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 yeah. I like his stuff. <laughs> um, but I think that we're going to find some differences, which is all good. Um, yeah. Now, Joe, when we were setting this up, one of the things that you wanted to talk about, uh, which was the infinite banking concept, and we could talk about Ms. Mr. presentation on that all day long, but oh yeah, you, you were mentioning something about high high frequency borrowing. Can you yes, elaborate that, on that? What the dangers were? I think you're talking about the dangers to the company. Um, it, so, it, it's it, so I'll give you some real life. Uh, experience. I have a client here in Chicago who is, whose family was in banking. They since sold the bank, uh, but they were in banking for 80 some years. And the, pay, uh, the older brother was on the board of directors of mutual trust. And my family goes back with this family all the way back to the Great Depression. We had banked with them and the bank was, were clients of mine. Um, the brothers and family were our clients of mine. And the older brother comes to me, he's on the board of directors of mutual trust. He goes, John, can you help us out? I need you to sign an NCNDA and I wanna bring you out to uh, the offices in Oak Brook. So I signed the uh, non-circumvention, non-disclosure agreement. I went to, and, and it's since expired, so I can share this. Um, I went out to mutual trust in Oak Brook, Illinois, which is the town I grew up in. And I was confronted by the, not only the chairman and the CEO, they wanted to know why their lapse ratio was so high. And I said, it's real easy. Looking at your balance sheet here, the amount of policy loans you have relative to reserves is too high. LIMRA studies indicate 97% of all policy loans are never repaid. And it's not just LIMRA, it's basic economics. People don't like to repay loans. They don't, which is why people are generally debt averse. You know, I'm, I'm right now I'm at the University of Chicago getting a, an advanced degree in behavioral economics, and we are talking about that very same thing in class, although we do the class on the internet, which is a drag. But at any rate, um, that was one anecdote. The other anecdote comes from Nelson Nash's brother-in-law himself. And his brother-in-law, David Steens or Stearns or whatever his name was, says to me at one time, don't tell Nelson, but I don't repay my loans. And Nelson even copped to the fact that in the original text of Infinite Banking, his, his book, Becoming Your Own Banker, that his illustrations were woefully out of date. All that having been said, the concept of high frequency borrowing, which we, which we generically refer to in the, in the industry as infinite banking, is incredibly dangerous to insurance companies. Because when you're a properly designed IBC policy is going to have a lot more paid up ads than it is hard premium, probably two to one or three to one. And 
ALIR or PUA or OPP, every company has a different acronym for, you know, additional paid up ads. Those monies can't be, re, can't be invested in reserves because they don't know when the redemptions or the withdrawals are going to occur. I, I've been very fortunate to be taught by some great actuaries in this business, both from Guardian, where I started, and Mass Mutual, where I am now, and Bobby Samuelson, who I think is the smartest guy in the life insurance business, about how this stuff really works and how it's built. And, you know, there's no magic to life insurance. It's the time value of money. The insurance company pays claims out of cash flow. They don't pay claims out of reserves. Reserves are the last money they ever want to hit. The reserves are there in case they go BK so they can make good on the contractual obligations. This doesn't mean that, that borrowing from your life insurance is wrong. It's there, the cash values are there and the, and the loan provision is there as a benefit to the policyholder. However, when it comes to infinite banking, actually when it comes to finance in general, and in my practice, I consult on a lot of M&A work and a lot of private placement work. So I am intimate with this. The cheapest source of funds is always your best bet. I've got a couple of billion in face and most of my clients are closely held businesses or highly compensated professionals, attorneys, doctors, et cetera. There's not a one of them that doesn't, that I don't slap a third party cash value line of credit on their policies because those are loans at very favorable rates, LIBOR plus a margin, mm -hmm. and they don't hit your credit report. Right. Infinite bank your butt away off that, <laughs> but leave the cash value with the company. The cash value is the collateral for the death benefit. And in, in, in truth, the cash value is nothing more than the net present value of the death benefit at the reserve rate. Mm -hmm. Don't believe me? Take out your HP 12.1c and take out a ledger and do the math. At least the guaranteed cash value has got to stay there. Paid up ads are a little bit different because that's the insurance company's gift to you. So it's not that I'm against infinite banking. What I'm against is the, um, the ubiquitousness of it and the proliferation of it to largely unsophisticated consumers. You know, one of the biggest misnomers in infinite banking is you're paying yourself back. No, right. you're not. Read your life insurance contract. The life in, you own the contract. The insurance company owns the, the equity. You own the contract. The mm -hmm. equity is merely a representation of what you paid in and what they gave back to you. So when you borrow from the insurance company at five or six, um, you're paying rent on somebody else's money. That's what interest is. And it's not accurate to deduct the dividends or interest credit against the loan rate. They're uncorrelated. But that doesn't mean you can't borrow. Look, I borrow all the time. And I still use the car analogy. When you cut out there a bit, John. Oh. Um, uh, but what I was going to mention was that uh, a lot of times in whether it's whole life or index universal life, however, they're, they're promoting infinite banking with whatever policy, but often the, you know, they'll say, well, you're paying yourself back. And as you said, no, you're not, you're paying the insurance company back. It's the insurance company's money and they get to charge a usury rate of that interest. And sometimes they say, well, you get that interest credited back to you, but the dividends being credited is not correlated to the interest you paid. It is not a direct oh. thing. It's kind of like, well, if you're going to pay an interest to a bank, but you happen to own stock in that bank, that whatever you're paying as a dividend doesn't mean that you're getting your interest back. 
Right. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You know, interest is rent paid on money. I would advise everybody, or I would recommend everybody on this call, read Henry Hazlitt's economics in one lesson. I will have or to go get a, that on Amazon yeah. and make sure we, uh, we promote that. Um. <laughs> yeah. Or even a basic book on money and banking. Yeah. Absolutely. Tom, do you have any thoughts on what, what John has said? I'm sure we're pretty much in agreement on all that, but. Uh. Oh, absolutely. I, I think your, your comment, John, about an unsophisticated consumer yeah, I would I would argue that it start it started with the, the agent. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, no, no, no question agent. about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and I think our industry does such a crappy job of explaining how stuff works. Um, you know, life insurance will sell itself all day, every day. It's yep. it's what we do with it that has a tendency to kind of muddy the water. Yep, I, I'm on a mission. The older I get. And I, I really do want to give back to the industry the basics. Um, I, I want to get back to, I believe if we were trained, all of us were trained differently on how to be our own person and why we do what we do. I, I think we would all be top of the table producers and we'd all have a much healthier life. But man, the way, I mean, I'm, I'm part of David's life insurance agent discussion group, and I see some of the conversations that go, and I just, I, I, I'm constantly vomiting in my mouth and and, and, <laughs> and and being so adamant about not just getting on the damn keyboard and going, where in the hell do you live? And, and let me know where you are so I never meet you. It's um, terrible. Oh, it's horrible. Absolutely yeah. horrible. It, it, you're, you're absolutely right. That, that, you know, going back to Bob Castellone, you know, we could vilify him at all different levels because we've all had bad experiences with him, but we also had really great experiences with him. And that was that was ultimately when he set out his point was to educate. And, and you know, having grown up in a family business um, in manufacturing and we distributed our, our, our products through manufacturers reps. So it really wasn't dissimilar to the life insurance industry. Because life insurance companies distribute their product through manufacturers' reps. We just call them agents. The life insurance company is a manufacturer. They really don't have any stake in the outcome. Because here's a dirty little secret of the life insurance business. And this was shared to me by a couple of lobbyists uh, whose names I will not divulge. And a couple of home office executives from a couple of companies whose names I will not divulge. The three year lapse rate on life insurance is in excess of 30%. So the insurance company, knowing that that's true and knowing that they need cash flow called premiums to keep their enterprise afloat, is continually focusing on the new and better product, the new and better product, the new and better product, and agents go running to it. The market for life insurance hasn't changed in over 50 years. So what does that mean? That means most of the sales occurring in the industry are replacements. It's going from one company to the next. It's not expanding and, the marketplace. And our industry still has a, a two-faced attitude. We will still give the new agent who brings over all of the business that's already been expensed four times, <laughs> give them brand new accolades and trophies. Yep. And if that person were to do the same thing with the company they're with, they're terminated for cause. Yeah. So, so you've got an industry that can't even police itself trying to beat the system oh my god wow. yeah i mean it's we've got to separate ourselves and, and and i think and i think you'll agree with this tom that the raa space does it a lot better than the insurance space what's that the ria yeah the registered investment advisory you know the independence uh the in, independent registered investment advisory space handles the development of their advisors much better than we do. 
I remember at a Mutual of New York convention when I first started my career, they had a sales psychologist come up and speak. And he said, you guys are so lucky because the minute that Merrill Lynch begins to learn this is all about relationships and not transactions, every one of you are unemployed. Yep. I, I have a friend of mine whose daughter went to the University of Wisconsin that has a tremendous uh, personal financial planning program that culminates in a CFP um, qualification. And she took her first job and she's at, she's at Merrill Lynch. Merrill Lynch advisors are taught. And, and usually when, 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 when a new advisor comes into Merrill Lynch, they're assigned a team. They're, they either stay with that team or they evolve and grow and spin out of that team. Their first three years is about 50% of their workload is studying um, in excess of the CFP content and learning prospecting. They are not allowed to cold call. They are not allowed to direct mail. It's workshops, referrals, and LinkedIn. That's it. David Barry Lynch. wants to ask a question. I think he's got his hand yeah, raised. I'll, I'll make sure we got to Barry's question. Okay. Barry, what, what's on your mind, brother? Hey guys, hey John, and and now I know how to. I'm just going to say Ouija board from now on when I when I read your name, and I think I'm going to get really close. My my business cards are actually a, a Ouija board. Oh, I love it. I love <laughs> it. Uh, <laughs> hey, um, <clears throat> going back to your commentary on. Um, on loans and, and interest rates, I, I just, you know, a quick comment and then, and then two questions. One, I have to say that just the whole idea, just the language of infinite banking and bank on yourself, I, I think just the language itself is so fundamentally flawed. The person who's receiving the interest is the bank, and that's the yeah. life insurance company. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I even see people who are teaching quote, infinite banking, banking yourself type strategies. And I see the comments from the people supposedly that they've trained and they're still saying, oh, you're, you're going to, instead of paying the bank, you'll pay yourself. That's just not true. It's yeah. Completely inaccurate. You, you know where that so, came from? You, you know where that came from? Pamela Yellen. Pamela Yellen. Pamela, yeah. Pamela yeah. Yellen's an information marketer. Yeah. Um, maybe 20 years ago, she hooked up with Nelson and, you know, she was, you know, a disciple of Dan Kennedy and magnetic marketing. Yep. And she wrote the book bank on yourself. She bought a shitload. Oops, sorry. Didn't mean to say that she bought a bunch of time on time brokered radio and on Sirius and satellite radio, selling her commercials, set up a call center offshore, started selling territories to, um, to licensed life insurance agents and was mass marketing. The agents don't know any better because they're just repeating her drivel. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I knew Pamela way back when she was, you know, hawk, she was a wholesaler hawking annuities. So, you know, oh, everybody's geez. fast, right? I, I used to do seminars with her on Dan because I was a Dan Kennedy disciple myself. So, I, I mean, I go back with her, too. I, I've been and, paying Dan Kennedy for 40 years. <laughs> okay, so, you know, yeah, it works. Yeah. Lumpy mail still works. Lump, I love lumpy mail so much. <laughs> Uh, so here's my question. So um, I, I encourage people to, um, to during we'll call it, we'll, we'll just call it accumulation phase distribution phase for for common language. So I encourage people when they want to to borrow, repay, borrow, repay, borrow, repay, and then the only the last loan that they don't repay is the we'll call it the retirement distribution loan. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> The other piece of this is I try to encourage them to say, well, yes, you could borrow from your policy and, you know, still have, you know, avoid the opportunity cost if you're buying a car. But that's a depreciating asset. If you can, it would be really nice if you use the loans for appreciating assets where yeah. you're not at risk, like real estate and yeah. things like that. That's yeah. really using it, uh, you know, I think really effectively. I think the last point is, and this is one I've struggled with because I really want to be accurate in my language and representation. And, and one of the things you said, John, really kind of hit me was if I'm if I'm if I have my loan rate in one ledger, because it's a completely separate transaction from whatever my policy is being credited in another ledger, um, is it fair, I'll just say linguistically, to say that you're because I don't I, I used to say that you're net therefore your net borrowing cost is X, or if it's even a, a yeah. watch 
zero. And I, I'm like, well, they don't technically net against each other. No, maybe, maybe in the air somewhere, but not in real life. No, they don't. Because remember, a dividend is a return of unused premium. A dividend early on is mostly unused premium. It doesn't turn into excess. It doesn't turn into more excess earnings until about after year 15. Now, however, the, the, the revisions to Section 7702, which were the biggest godsend Congress could have given the life insurance industry, and to Tom's point, we should all be knocking down a million of premium a year with the new products. Um, yeah, 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 you lobbyists. Yeah, no, they, they did a great job, and I'm going to give props. One of the people we all owe is Allison Weiss, head of government relations at Mass Mutual. She was a pit bull. Because the original proposal that Congress was going to give us was reserve rates set at the AFR, which would have been a long-term disaster. Yeah, would and be. now we've got reserve rates at two percent. And thank Richie Neal too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because he knew all about seventy-seven oh two. Yep, yep, absolutely. If I, have a, if I have a policy that let's just say I'm going to try to use it, I want to use two numerical examples. Let's say the loan. I'm trying to think of it. Well, let's even just use a wash loan just to make it really, really clean and clear. If, if my if my credit on my if my charge rate on my loan and my credit on my policy are the same, um, I still I, I just feel like when people borrow, I, I always say, look, you figure out how much you're going to borrow, pick a term, you know, HP 12C stuff, pick an interest rate at least equal to the rate charged by the life insurance company or greater, yep. and then come up with your own little amortization schedule on that simple interest loan. And then pay yeah. back because you'd have but to remember, it, remember, if you're going to charge a rate higher than the insurance company, most of what you're paying back is just your PUA. Because you can't put more money into a contract beyond the hard premium or the schedule premium. The schedule and there's here. a dirty little secret about PUAs or OPP or ALIR or whatever the hell, you know, your, your given company uh, wants to call it about 7% of that premium is load. Yeah, the old premium premium loads are, but, but if you're doing a loan repayment and, you, and you're actually designated as a loan repayment, doesn't it bypass the, the load on a regular premium payment? No, because um, we are, I remember being on the product committee at Mass and I, we had a, we had a uh, use it or lose it uh, paid up additions rider. And I said, you know, that's really dumb because Guardian, Northwestern, New York Life, they all have stop and go and you don't lose it. And what I was told and then brought into the lab and shown the math was that the, 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 there's a cost to the stop and go because the insurance company, like any other financial institution, needs consistent premium flow. And paid up excess riders, paid up addition riders aren't guaranteed. So they have to insure against anti-selection. That's why that extra load is in there. Now, we wound up doing it for market forces. You know, we had to do it, but it's expensive. Yeah. And then I, this kind of could be a John question or a Tom question or both. Um, I have my own explanation, but I don't want to uh, influence your answers. Um, if someone asks you about uh, a premium load, I, I have a list of things that I, I represent that, you know, these are the expenses an insurance company incurs and deals with that. But I, I just want to say, how do you guys respond to the premium load question? Um, and, and by the way, I do do uh, like, you know, uh, current assumption ULs or IULs as well as whole life. So, you know, I kind of, it's kind of across the spectrum of, of those products and a little handled a little differently, but how do you address that? If someone asks, if it's in the illustration. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. <laughs> um, okay. So we're going back to the beginning of time when the only <laughs> product available was term and the people said, you know what? I don't want to have to keep paying an increased premium. So let's come up with a level premium. So we'll take all the expenses out at the beginning to offset the costs that will, that will be happening the older I get. 
So for those people that wanted coverage at the time of death, term insurance was never the answer. There was a level premium term insurance contract that they called whole life. So the loads are completely different. IUL is a pay as you go. Whole life is pay up front. Term is yep. pay as you go. Yep. So and when somebody wants to get into the nickels and the dimes and the quarters, I won't go there. It has nothing to do with what we're trying to accomplish. Nothing yep. to do. It. And when you buy your automobile, do you want to look at the the timing belt and, and, and when the when the spark plug is actually igniting the fuel, or do you just want to get the damn car, turn the key and go somewhere? So there's a lot of things under the hood that you could learn all about. But I don't think that's really part of the whole the conversation. If you want to do that, I'll get you a book. There's 13,000 of them written about all of this. I, I agree. I mean, I think there's, there's, you know, the black box of it all. Um, and... Well, Don Blanton would say, would say jokingly, you want to know where that first year's cash value went? Want to go see my new car? <laughs> yeah, but that's actually not true, though, because the low... The, and I have, I, I cannot share this. I cannot share this. I will get, I, I, I like to joke that I'm beyond getting fired from Mass Mutual. I probably am, but this would probably do it. I actually have on my hard drive given to me uh, a couple of years ago from the chief pricing actuary and unbundled life insurance policy, everything line itemed out. The bulk of the first year premium does not go to comms. It goes to reserves. 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 The yep. first seven years go to reserves. The comms are paid by existing premium coming into the company. Just like the death benefit is. And Tom's a hundred Tom's a hundred percent right in what he said. Here's a good analogy that I say. I go, you ever buy a new car? Yeah. Are you concerned about the wholesale price of steel? Because the price of the car that you're going to buy is not set by BMW or Mercedes or Audi or Chevy or Tesla. It's set by the market. The wholesale price of steel affects all car manufacturers. And there is a point at which they might all have to raise prices because the raw material costs went up. No different with the life insurance. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, Barry, was that good for you? That was great to me. Um, so, Sorry, uh, trying to back myself to unmute. Yeah, that was great. It's um, I I, I just have a lot of respect for the, the time in the saddle that that these two gentlemen have had, and I thought that's one of the one of the ones that I've just always <clears throat> I I I know it goes to a lot of things, and it's just a, you know, but sometimes people will. I, I hate the fact that it even says load, you know, as compared to kind of mutual fund language. But um, yeah, that was very helpful. Thanks, guys. I got to drop off, but uh, Barry, let me it. let me give you one comment before you before you take off. My largest sale. The, the doctor looked at me and said, I hope you make a fortune. Yeah. And, and the reason is because nobody is out there talking like the way you're talking. The people who don't want to buy what you're asking them to buy are the people that are concerned about the cost, what I could have done with something else, and they'll yeah. bitch the rest of your life. Well, look so, at all the money saving them in taxes and, and money not lost. And, they don't you know, see that. They get market returns. Let's yeah. add all that up and compare it to that front end. No, they won't go there. They won't go there. So when you when you have a conversation that's building on what are you going to make? Where's this load going? Is this your car payment? Is this? Blah, 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 blah. I go. You know what? We're just not a good fit. We're not a good fit, and and walk away. Yeah. Those are the, by the way. Those are the clients that will call you at four o'clock on a Friday, and you look at your caller ID and go, "Oh shit, it's you." <laughs> right. So when you can understand, you get to choose who you get to work with. And, and all of us need to do a better job of vetting. Remember, I started this whole day by telling you, I go around the country giving people permission to fire clients, fire them. If they don't believe as you do, get rid of them. This guy that's asking these types of questions does not believe what you believe. So just be careful. I'm not saying don't take the client because I've been in a contest. I've been late on a mortgage payment. I get it. I get it. But if we're taking it for the wrong reason, man, it will come back to bite you in the butt. It will. Always, man, always. 
profiling is, I think, job one. You know, and going it all back begins to- with what I believe. Th- this is what I want to do. This is to whom I wish to do it with. And this is the benefit they're going to get. You want to work with me? If not, I could. Ca- Bye. I just, wanted to, I just want to add one last part, which is that uh, with regard to interest and the policies and how they're credit, the, the, I think that the best way to describe um, where the interest goes is that you can reimburse your policy back of the interest that could be charged against it. You're not paying yourself the interest or you're not, you know, you're not getting the interest back from the company, but you're restoring the policies, values and schedule yeah. of, of benefits. To me, that's the, the best way to describe that particular part of, of infinite banking. So I just wanted to get that out there. With um, a direct recognition yeah. contract, yes, but not a non-direct recognition contract. Remember, when Nelson wrote the book, the one thing he did do right, he did a lot of things right with the book. I don't, I don't know about the subsequent books that have come after. He designed policies that were like two to one, three to one, PUA to hard premium. So the excess that you're paying back is the PUA. It's not interest. Mm. All right. I still have to wrap my head around that one. But uh, I did get a question. Uh, Cynthia sent me a, a question here. I want to make sure we get this asked. And so she asked, is there harm in using permanent life insurance for tax-free retirement distributions uh, through policy loans or even the lifetime income rider? Um, we're going to have some fun on that one. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm going to hold back. I'm going to hold back on that one. Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> uh, first, let's get our vernacular correct. It's not tax-free. It's yeah. tax-exempt. There, A tax-free item is re- referenced as a preference item, meaning it's still going to be included on your tax return, either for a state income tax, potentially, but it's a, it's, there's a 1099 associated with tax-free. Yep. A tax exempt means there's no recollection of any distribution at all. And, and, and here's what I want to emphasize to the group. Life insurance, what everybody here is talking about, is nothing more than a form of collateralization. You are collateralizing the cash value, just like you collateralize the equity in your home, just like you collateralize a reverse mortgage, just like you collateralize a margin account. All of it is a form of keeping my money to my chest and borrowing somebody else's. Is there an expense with borrowing somebody else's money? Yes, always. It will ever be an expense. Always will be. But when you understand how collateral works, there's only one form of collateral where the lender guarantees the growth of the asset they've loaned against. And that's crappy trash value life insurance. So you can margin. It's what Warren Buffett does. You can get mortgages. That's great. But you got coupon books. You can do a reverse mortgage, that's awesome. But when you talk about using life insurance as a distribution vehicle, I haven't found anything in the tax code that even comes close to spending money the way that you could spend money. You do not need a retirement plan to retire, you need money. money. And where your money is is more important than what it earns. Oh, that was great. Say that one more time, that was beautiful. You do not need a retirement plan to retire. You need money. And where your money is parked is more important than what it earns. And if you understood how wealth is taxed on the distribution side, 90% of the people that are doing what they're doing will change course. The problem with our industry is that none of us are really aware of how wealth works. We know how product works. We can read a prospectus and tell you on page 42, this is what it should say. But I'm not required by law to help you understand the implications of any decision you choose to make. Even as you know, that, that, that that's fantastic. That was great. Um, I want to. I want. I'm, I'm going to plug myself here, David, because I'm so excited about this. It's February 15th through the 17th of 2023, in Nashville, Tennessee, we're going to have a day and a half symposium with. The following speakers, it's going to be David McKnight, Tom Hagna, Van Miller, Jim Ruda, myself, Cody Askins, and we're still looking for more speakers. So there will be a cost. It'll be at the Country Music Hall of Fame um, at the auditorium, and we've got um, plenty of hotel space. There will be an expense. 
just be on the lookout. We're going to be posting this with David um, in his various groups, but I am thrilled about that. We just got all of the speakers to commit to this, and, and I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to be We're fantastic. doing ours around the same date. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, crap. But it's not in Nashville, is it? Yeah, we, we do this, the WBC symposiums in Nashville because it's cheaper than Chicago and it's equally as easy to get into. Yeah. <laughs> Southwest hub. Yep. <laughs> the going back to the original question um, about tax free retirement income. Um, David knows this. Kinder knows this. I, I personally have a huge problem with it based on behavioral economics. Um, Tax-free retirement income or tax-free distributions, tax exempt, I'm sorry, tax exempt, because Tom is, uh, Tom Love is right. Tax exempt distributions as a form of retirement income supplement have been around since the 1920s. There's a, a seminal book that was written in the life insurance industry called Head, Heart, Heels. It is long out of print. Um, I gave a copy to David. Um, and it's way better than, than, and you can probably get it from him. I'm sorry, David, but you know, you put this together. So you get a little bit of work to do the it's better because it's better than Hebner's economics of life insurance, which is like insomniac theater. You know, I mean, you're three pages into it and you're out like a light, but, um, that concept has been around since the 1920s. If it really worked, we wouldn't have a retirement income crisis in this country and permanent life insurance wouldn't be vilified. Now that's not to say it can't work, but what prevents it from working? Behavioral economics. When I started in this business 26 years ago, I had this crazy idea that people would pay premiums forever. They don't. Number one. Number two, dividend rates go up, dividend rates go down. And it doesn't, and, 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 this, and it's no different with IUL. IUL and whole life are different sides of the same coin. In IUL, to Tom's point, you're paying as you go. In whole life, you're paying all up front. <clears throat> the, but the, the insurance company controls the levers. So with an IUL, they control the cap and the floor. I got one on my on my desk right now. This guy's been paying a million dollars a year into what was then 10 years ago, Pac Life's best policy. The cash value is seven million bucks. But the illustration said six. Why? Because the floor and caps have changed. And even a zero floor is still a negative return because you got the you got the insurance charges. So in, in, in a whole life policy, you know, look, they're all the same. New York Life, Northwestern Mutual, Mass Mutual, Guardian, every actuary goes to the same classes, reads the same textbooks. Every policy works the same. Cash value has to equal death benefit at endowment. And I've got enough business in force and I know enough experienced agents who have got, you know, 20 years more in this business on me that I look at illustrations and, and I compare them to the original sales illustration. Now, shameless plug, I will say that Mass Mutual is a little bit more accurate than other carriers. Um, and I'm not going to say that other carriers are necessarily off, but by the time you get out to age 100 and they endow, they're all mere basis points from each other. I mean, if you really want to know how this stuff works, there's a great book. It's a hard read. Lawrence Ripka, JD, 
Life Insurance 10X. It's a tough, tough, tough read. And Dick Weber's Life Insurance as an Asset Class, not is an asset class, but as an asset class. And that mostly focuses on UL type products um, and the management that's required in those. But the better use of life insurance in retirement is the leverage of the death benefit to annuitize investment assets or to use the cash value, as Tom said, as collateral, but not as an income stream. As a loan, after a year where your investments don't equal, or the return on your investments aren't equal to or greater than your withdrawal rate. It all begins with the withdrawal rate. This stuff is not a silver bullet. You know, I, I tell people, you know, what they say, I, I, I was sitting at a restaurant in Chicago the other night and, you know, it was like, it was, it was a thank you God moment. I'm talking to an oncologist who's 56 years old who's making $1.8 million a year and he tells me, I'm going to retire. Um, what can you do for me if I hired you? My answer was, I don't know. His next question was, I got $2 million in cash. Where should I put it? I said, I don't know. You're asking the wrong question. How much money do you want to retire on? What percentage of it do you want guaranteed? How much liquidity do you want to maintain? And remember, liquidity is money not being used for income purposes and how much- Starting to fade there. out there, John, just so you know, you're starting to fade. I'm, I'm sorry, oh, I faded out, I'm sorry. Well, I'm on my cell phone because my, my computer is screwed up. So okay. number one, how much income do you want? Number two, what percentage do you want guaranteed? Number three, how much do you want to meet, or how much do you want to, how much do you want to maintain as liquidity? And liquidity is money not being used to generate income because you can't have both out of the same pool of assets. And how much legacy do you want to leave? And the best, the best education you're going to get on that, shameless plug, Wade Fowle, Chief Research Officer, Wealth Building Cornerstones, <laughs> um, Safety First Retirement Planning. Actually, all four of Wade's books are the best, and the RICP curriculum is fantastic. And it's quick. You can knock it off in like three months, four months. Yeah, so it's not, it's not the life insurance as an income stream. Life insurance is just another financial instrument that plays a role with all of the other financial instruments. Annuities are great. Investments are great. Home equity lines of credit are fantastic. Those are truly tax exempt. That's a real tax exempt asset. I have a client on Long Island who's a widow who has a $30 million estate in the Hamptons and we're taking a reverse mortgage against it. <laughs> it, took it. Me week, it took me weeks to negotiate that with, with Goldman Sachs and they loved it. Nice. I want to caution people one, one thing. When I go on the interweb and I see these whether it's infinite bank or whatever, talking about income that's tax-free or tax-exempt income, be careful because income needs to be de needs to be itemized on a tax return. If it's income, you must declare it. The distributions that we're talking about here are nothing more than collateralization distributions, and distributions yep. are deferred or referred to as cash flow. Income is and always will be 100% subject to a current income tax. Always don't use income and loans in the same dialogue. They're not even alike. Mm -hmm. so cash flow is exempt. Certain types of cash flow is exempt from taxation. But if you're talking about income, we're going to set up a retirement plan to provide you some income. We're going to use cash value. No, you will, you will find a, a dark sedan in your front <laughs> yard with a four door and, and four guys in dark suits, they won't use a red tie. That's something that should be dark blue. You won't see them in the, the cloak of darkness, but they will pay you a visit and it ain't pretty. 
So be careful. The, the industry needs to do a better job policing ourselves. Income is taxed. Yeah. Everything we're talking about here is exempt because of the collateralization rules, not because of the income tax rules. Income tax rules are clear. You make it, you owe money on it. I'm not making any money. I'm borrowing somebody else's. Why do you think those three tax returns had very little income tax? They're, they're smart enough to not produce an income. They have cash flow. They have margins. They have life insurance. They don't have income. And every investment we have, especially a retirement plan, forces an income tax. Let's yep. start with the end in mind and work backwards. Rather than start today and go, well, who cares what happens in the future? I do. I do. <laughs> I want to know what happens in the future. And I want to minimize that risk by knowing what the rules of the game are. Tell me what the rules are, and I'll play a game better than you. But we have people who are bringing hockey pucks to a baseball diamond saying, coach, I'm ready to play. You're in a wrong hemisphere, pal. Yep. We've, got to, we've got to educate us, us, collectively, us. So we can go out and give a good, a good message. When I'm speaking in front of Congress, I, this is a, one of the conversations I always tell people about. I was with the congressman. He said, Tom, what can we do to help the insurance industry? And I said, with all due respect, absolutely nothing, <laughs> nothing, please. And I mean, no what? disrespect. We don't need any more regulation. But I said, do you have any, do you own life insurance? And he's so, so proud. And he goes, yes. And I said, who are they? And he said, Guardian and Northwestern. I said, my God, those are some of the two best insurance companies in the country. Have either of those agents told you how to use any of it? And he said, no, why? And I said, because you're missing the biggest reason having it. That's what's wrong with our industry, sir, with all due respect. There isn't a place we can go get education on what we've already done. You made a yeah. decision to buy two of the best and you have two agents that don't know what the hell they're doing. And the two agents most of the time are arguing over how much more of your AUM to grab. Oh yeah, because that's the fee. I get fees. You know, we structure our payments differently so that when you do better, we do better. And what they don't finish the sentence with and when you lose 60%, we still do damn well. Let's be real, people. The yeah. Education is the key. You educate, people will stand in line to buy it. Quit selling it. Sell the problem you solve, not the product. It's the problem. So there was something I was, when I was on my way to the office today, because I haven't been here in three days, um, the, I was thinking about, you know, what's important. And I do these, I do these talks, um, weekly in my eight or I'm sorry, monthly in my agency and bi-monthly for the mass mutual field. And then we do a monthly for wealth building cornerstones. Tom's right. Now, how do you make it actionable? You have to have the right prospect. So here's the analogy. I know we're all from different parts of the country. I'm going to kind of just use a, a Chicago analogy. There's a far southwestern suburb called Alsip. Nice town. It's largely working class and immigrants. It is a low income, little bit dicey neighborhood. It butts up against Palos Hills, which is a big money, old money suburb. Mercedes-Benz does not put a dealership in Alsip. They put a dealership in Palos Hills. So what does that mean to us? You have to have the right message to the right person at the right time. The only thing we can't control in that equation is time. What gives us greater control is the right message to the right person. And that's called profiling. My, one of my first mentors in this industry was a guy by the name of Wayne Cotton, who was a genius. And he taught me profiling. So a profile, here's how you profile. 
you look at your last, you look at your prior year, you look at your 10 best cases by revenue. You look at all of the similarities of those buyers. There's going to be three to four outliers. Like last year, I wrote an $11 million premium. Okay. It was a family office. They're an outlier. <laughs> They're definitely an outlier. So then I look at the other nine. And out of the other nine, there were three that, you know, okay, two were relatives. And one was a single guy at 29 years old who happened to be light years ahead of maturity. I took them out. Then I was left with the similar seven. Age, income, occupation, social style, right? Married. Like personally, I won't work with divorced people. Nothing against being divorced. They're not good buyers. Why? Because they've been burned by the dream and they're cynical. You know, for me at 53 years of age, my profile based on my similar seven is a closely held business owner or highly degreed professional in private practice. I don't do well with corporate executives or corporate employees, never have. Um, who have a high self-esteem, are involved in their communities and their industries, are married and have kids under the age of 18, or at least in college. That is my highest, and in, in income, nah, I don't put too much weight on income. I really don't, you know, 250, 300, 500, 5 million, 10 million, it's all the same. I got clients that are billionaires. I got clients that operate punch presses. Everybody's got the same concern. That's where your, that's where your effort needs to be. And you create a message. So the message we use, and I know Tom uses this message because Art taught it to him as well as Art taught it to me. So do you plan on retiring someday? Really? So what's your plan to turn your assets into income? You know what? We said, you know, life's pretty funny. We spend the first 30 years of our life accumulating assets, putting money into things. And then for the next 30 or 40 years, we got to take money out of things. But there's three questions we don't know. When do we start? How much should we have? And exactly how long does this second half of my life last? I help people solve those questions. I had a client, who won't, I had a client who was a billionaire. He died. He's dead. I can talk about him now. His biggest fear in life with a net worth of about $3 billion. He owned the Minnesota Grizzlies. And Mike's biggest fear, who started with nothing, was running out of money. We happened to share the same accountant. My accountant, our accountant set up the meeting, signed the NCNDA. Mike came over. I was probably about 36 years old at the time. He was in his early 60s. And I asked him, I said, Mike, what the hell are you doing here? He goes, son, do you know what it takes to be a billionaire? I said, no, that's kind of why I wanted to take the meeting. He goes, I've got 400,000 employees coast to coast. Every decision I make affects somebody's dinner, affects how they raise their children, affects how they retire. He goes, I don't have one plane. I have two, and I don't want either of them, but I have to have them. And I looked at him. I said, are you afraid of running out of money? He goes, you bet your ass. It takes a lot of money to be a billionaire. No different from the punch press operator to the guy who owned the Minnesota Silver Timberwolves. Wow. Okay, I want to go into one last question and then we can segue into uh, some other parts. But uh, Terrence had asked, uh, he was number 17 out of 250 at his company for life production. That's awesome. 
Um, That's but, awesome. Uh, but it's not a great year by by Love and Us. We just I think he put my name in there. I'm taking my name out. Um, but the number one was right at 100K. What two things would you tell your mentee to improve that? And this is for all three of us. And at the same time, please um, talk also how you've taken what you've learned before and you've adjusted it into your new uh, strategies, how you've evolved from what we talked about in the beginning, which was, you know, what we are kind of our foundations. And because both of you have your own separate platforms. And if you have any events with that, let's talk about that, too. I private <laughs> we get to advertise. Him. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, because I, I, I didn't know if Terrence was going to be able to get his answer. So I went ahead and private message, messaged him. I said, I think everyone on the call should learn how to communicate with people, become a person of interest, and stand for something. Yep. I gave you three. I'm going to plug my coach, Tommy Schaff, MajorLeagueSales.com. Um, I love Tommy. Tommy Gay, I, I am a, this is a little aside, I am a, a collector of rock and roll memorabilia. Tommy gave me the coolest gift I ever got. I have George Harrison's life insurance policy and a copy of the Beatles buy sell agreement. That's pretty awesome. But Tommy developed a sales system that is rooted not only in Sandler, but also in neuro-linguistic programming. Tommy built Sales Mastery with Chet Holmes for Tony Robbins. And Tommy, because he wanted to raise a family, left Tony Robbins, licensed his IP content, Chet died, um, and that became Tony Robbins Sales Mastery. You gotta learn how to sell all of the product knowledge in the world all of the planning techniques in the world don't mean anything unless you stand for something and you can communicate that quickly, efficiently, and with power. I took 23 agents at Mass Mutual from leaders to top of the council in 18 months. And it was a combination of my stuff or our stuff with the Sangers, Wealth Building Cornerstones, the combination of my weird esoteric black box strategies, which are more akin to the family office market than they are the, uh, than they are the retail market, and Tom Schaff. You gotta invest in sales training. And it's got to be a regular, ongoing thing. It's not just one. The best stuff is a conglomeration of wherever you get it from. And however we twist it, and bend it, just to adjust it for ourselves. Absolutely. Um, and kind of right on that, since, uh, you know, Tom will be next, but we actually have for the Breakaway League on the 25th, how to make a strong explanation of services, free event. So we've already got that scheduled for the 25th. It's free. Get in there. Uh, and we'll, we can talk about how to make, uh, how to have a strong explanation of services. So Tom, if you want to talk some more about that. And um, I don't know if you know, but we scheduled a boot camp for the ninth. So I want to make sure yeah. that you know that. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Um, one of the biggest um, problems, I think, in the industry, according to Limber Statistics, when people are polled as they're leaving our industry, what, what, why did you fail? they will tell you, I didn't see enough people. I would argue they saw plenty of people, but had nothing to say to most of them. So the average person pre-COVID saw 200 people a week. So if you pride yourself on having nine appointments for that week, wonderful. And I would argue the 191 that you didn't would probably be a better appointment than the nine you coerced into making the appointment if you knew how to speak. So the explanation of services is something that I have, uh, I'm, I'm right now, it's going to press. Um, it's a workbook and a book, but it's how to answer the question, what do you do for a living? So that within 15 to 20 seconds, you've identified someone who believes as you do. Doesn't guarantee a sale, but it figures out up front if the person you're talking to is a potential prospect. There's three parts to it. We're going to explain how it works. It all begins with having a why. Why are you in this business? Because if you're in this business simply to make money, I would suggest you open a Taco Bell 
you'll have more income and less frustration. If your goal in life is to do what you did when you got your license and how excited every single one of you were when you drove home and you said, I got the license, I can now start in the insurance industry. If you remember those days, that's what I want to do on that free webinar, that free Zoom meeting is I'm going to bring back the enthusiasm of why you're in this business so that you can go out and determine when, where, why, and to whom you want to speak. And every person you're next to is a potential prospect. I'll show you how to engage in a conversation. When I meet someone for the first time, my only objective, my only goal is to have that person eventually get around to asking me, what do you do for a living? And from that moment on, I own the rest of the conversation. But I may choose because of the way they're acting, the way they spoke to their spouse, the way that whatever, I may choose, look, I, I'm, I'm a proctologist. I don't, want to, I don't want to do business with you. But I get to choose. So if, it, if there's someone that you want to do business with, I will share with you how to engage in conversation so that you can become a person of interest. Be asked, what do you do for a living? And you'll be able to get an appointment. That's great. I'm coming. I'm a junkie for this stuff. Um, I will say you got to be really careful. And I think Tom will agree with this. You got to be really careful to whom you listen life insurance sales and financial product sales are a lot different than selling anything else um i own a number of businesses a lot of them actually the, the businesses outside of outside of financial services are all in commodities in the commodities business we don't have to sell because they're already gonna buy the product. In the life insurance business, however, there is no demand. We have to create the demand. That's why commissions are what they are. It's a marketing expense of the company. And believe me, if the companies could sell it on the back of a cereal box, they would, because they all hate us. I was at a meeting with John Hancock, and this is when the new chairman of the board came out. And, and, and by the way, you had to qualify to get there. And the first thing he said out of his mouth is that you, and he's talking to us, the qualifiers, the cream of the crop, right? You are the problem with this company. If we could find a way to get rid of you, we would do that in a heartbeat. Every lawsuit is because of you. And I'm going, God, I qualified to get here? <laughs> Gee, this is wonderful. The minute they, they can find a way to replace what we do, our commission is a dollar. Yep. That's it. Thank God this is tough. And, and my favorite quote, you're about to get a pay raise. It becomes effective the day you can be. And there's no difference between John, me, or anyone else on this call. We all have the same 24 hours a day. What are we doing different than what you're doing? I would argue a lot, a lot. But it all has to do with us. It, I want to get better. I'm not expecting the industry to get better and, better, and I'm sure as hell not waiting for products to get better. I need to get better. So the minute I start taking control of my outcome, my goals, my, and I hold myself accountable to failure, I will share this with you. You will learn more from your failures than you will from your success. Success is supposed to be expected. Failures people hate. But at the end of the day, you'll learn more from what went wrong that one, than what went right. So yep. don't be so adversive. If you fail, good. It's a learning opportunity. What did you learn from it? And never repeat it again. You want to get good? Get good. It begins with you, not me, not David, not John, not anybody else who wants to speak on these types of platforms. You can listen to us all day long and go, gee, I wish I could have, would have sound like him. Bull crap. Sound like you. Yep. Figure out what works and work for you. People buy authenticity and people buy candor and people buy humility. Who I am in front of a bunch of agents is a consequence of being trained by Bob Gastelum. Who I am in front of a prospect. <laughs> What's that? 
Is that a good thing being trained by Bob Castellone? To... <laughs> um, yes and no. Yes and no. Tom knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, I wish I had more art in me, the, uh, art Sanger in me, um, mm-hmm. than I had Bob. Than I have Bob Castellone in me. But it just it is what it is. But who I am in front of a prospect is not who I am in front of an agent. You yeah, got to be yeah, gentle. I, I, I get accused of being, boy, he's a, he's a pompous ass. He's the most arrogant <laughs> SOB. And I'm, I'm telling you, when you start making it in this world, there is a very slight difference between confidence and cockiness. And the people that don't know you will assume that your confidence is nothing more than being cocky. I've been called the cockiest man in the world. I, okay, but I would argue I believe it's confidence. Because if you want to give me an objection, try try you won't win and some people go are you confident sob you arrogant that's okay some will some won't some will try some will postpone some will regret they never did so what so what find people who believe as you do and then this is the most fun job you'll ever have in your life your homework begins with what do you really want why are you here what is your why and if you don't know what your why is, buy Simon Sinek's book, Find Your Why. Yep. Here's another good one. I, it's sitting on my desk right now. This is from a friend of mine. He is probably the most expensive coach in the industry. Steve Hardison in Phoenix, Arizona, charges $150,000 a year for one two hour session a month and you got to go to Phoenix to do it. The book is called the ultimate coach. It just came out. It's a really good companion to cynic and uh, shameless plug. Most of the vignettes and stories in this book are personal clients of mine. Um, and they are wildly, wildly successful. Um, Jonathan Kaiser in Phoenix, Arizona, John Veer, Timney Triggers. If you're a hunter, you know Timney Triggers. Um, Asgard Private Equity in New York. These, these guys are wildly successful beyond anyone's comprehension. They're not billionaires, but they've got the balance between their life and their work and their life is their work. And Steve lays out, because not everybody can afford 130 grand a year of coaching. I don't go to Steve because I can't get over the hump of having to fly to Phoenix once a month for a meeting. Um, but he lays out a really easy map. And it's about having humility. It's about being genuine and loving. Not the smartest guy in the room. Authentic. Yep. And, and that fits right in with the book I just got, which was, um, oh, and I put it up somewhere so I don't have it right in front of me. Um, but it was uh, Finding uh, finding Friends. I can't remember. It was Jim Ruda. Okay, here it is. In Search of Friends by George Sigurdsson. Uh, he wrote this book, I don't know, 20 years ago. And this one was published about 12. I got it from Jim Ruda's website. Um, don't know if he still has more copies, but it was just, you know, just looking for friends and how and you know, you take care of people like they're your friend and such. And it's just a different level of care. I was just like, I really appreciated that reinforcement because, you know, he's a pretty big producer up in Canada from what I've heard. I don't know much about him. I just know that his personal life premiums are about half a million a year. And from Canada, you have to make a lot in order to net half a million a year, let alone, <laughs> you know. Those were my thoughts. Um, John, do you have any plug or anything for Wealth Building Cornerstones? Um, I, I, I know I mentioned that a little bit, but I don't know if you had anything. Uh... Uh, look, I would be happy to uh, host with Jason and Art um, for anyone who wants a deep dive into Wealth Building Cornerstones. We're real protective about our IP. And it's not because we're trying to be arrogant because the, the, the Sangers are anything but that. True. It's it's just that our approach 
is so radically different. And we don't want to have what happened to Leap happen to WBC. That's why we don't give out free trials because you ain't going to understand it. It's not a calculator. It's a method. And I will say that the one of the things I learned from this, and I was really, really afraid of this with Tom being on here. I was really afraid. Tom, we got more in common as two organizations than we, than we have differences. And I'm going to call Art in about a half hour and go, we need to combine forces. Like I said, I don't know if you were on the call or not, but there is nothing out of my mouth that is new. Nothing. Everything I have said has been regurgitated by somebody else. And it's just the, the way in which we share the information. Yeah. So, and, and art is brilliant at this. It's, it's, you want to be unique in this business, stand out for something, quit dressing alike, quit looking alike, quit driving the same car, stand for something. And um, I, I had no idea what to expect other than uh, if it was going to get into a he said, she said, I'm just going to sit back and, and, and just kind of, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. That, that's what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, when I first, when, when our chairman of the board who retired first joined the company, I was flying around in the company jet giving my presentation. And they didn't tell me that I was going to Wisconsin to talk to a leap agency. I, so I'm out here giving my presentation and there were two people that were really listening to me and I had frowns. I had, I had daggers in my heart from 98% of the people in the audience. Yeah. There was one person in the back who was writing their ass off and that was Art. Yeah, yeah, that was Art. Art's a huge student. Chris Calabro is one of my closest friends in the entire industry too. He's the, he's the saving grace of Ohio National, I think. Well, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but they terminated me. Their number one what? agent for the last 10 years. Yeah. They, they sent me a letter that said, we're terminating your career contract. You have to fight to become an independent. <laughs> I've had no replacements, no 1035s, nothing, no complaints. I'm going to have my GA give you a call. We'll give you 105. <laughs> um, thank you, but no thank you. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. I never thought I was worth a hill of horse shit until all of a sudden people find out that you're not affiliated with anybody. And then all of a sudden, hey, we want to talk to you. Look, There's nothing okay. wrong with being an independent. It's just really hard. You know, I mean, I've been a career agent my entire career. Same here. Starting, starting with uh, uh, Northwestern Mutual for a cup of coffee with Luca Serra, who is a legend in this industry and is my family's agent to this day, who is in my agency now because we Mass Mutual bought him uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and then to Guardian for two years, and then to Mass because my Guardian GA took over a Mass shop. And you need, you need the collaboration, you need the camaraderie, uh, I'm biased, however, there is, there is a downside to being a career agent, and that is really draconian companies. And the only way to avoid that oppression is to be top 100, be top 200. Then you can get away with murder. Well, yeah, I was the number one for 10 years. Yeah, I know. I, I was yeah. asked to go away, so... Oh, I'm I, sorry. I, but, but, but my career was with Mutual of New York. They were bought out by Equitable. John Hancock, they were bought yeah. out by Manulife. Ohio National <laughs> bought out by the Canadian Retirement Fund. Yeah. So do you remember, Glenn, do you remember, Glenn, do you remember Glenn Bacicchi? No. no, no Mutual no. of New York? No. no. God, that's a long time. Do you, do you um, oh, we, let's not waste time. Yeah, <laughs> let's, yeah let's, not play, let's not play life insurance geography. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, not over time and everything. I want to get to Nathan's question there, uh, but uh, um, Nathan's asked, does anyone recommend the Selling from the Heart podcast and book? It's all about the need for authenticity in, in the selling community. Yes. I... D, all the above. There, there's no wrong way to get better. There is no wrong way to work on yourself. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to respectfully kind of diverge from what um, Tom's saying. 
I respect what he's saying. I've read every sales book there is. I've wasted a lot of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars going to sales gurus. I learned neuro-linguistic programming from the people that invented it, from the people who taught Tony Robbins. Um, I learned Sandler from David Matson, who was David Sandler's um, son-in-law. Um, okay. It retarded my development as a professional. When I found Tommy, it was a breath of fresh air. So the way I look at it is this. Remember the movie City Slickers? And um, Jack Talents as Curly is on his horse. And, you know, um, Billy Crystal and his cohorts you know, are all in the middle of their midlife crisis trying to figure out what's next in your life. Mm -hmm. And Curly holds up, Jack Palance holds up one finger. He goes, one. Now, this just fits to my personality. I'm a Capricorn. I was born in January. My birthday was Saturday. Happy birthday, David. Um, (laughs) We are wired differently than everybody else in the Zodiac. Uh, We just have single-minded purpose. And we get really arrogant and really pissy when, you know, and I do, when things don't go the way I expect or want, I turn into a complete, excuse the scatological language, a complete asshole. You may be one of those people that can take from a variety of different subjects. I can't. I can't, at least when, at least when it comes to sales training, I am really, really process driven and I got to have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And I default to what Tony Robbins said, find somebody who's really great at what they do and do exactly what they do. So it's, it's a different perspective. Some people can do it. I can't. I always blamed it on ADD. I didn't think it was my Zodiac sign. So that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just got a new perspective there. Okay. I'll blame my parents. Okay. All right. Um, we're way over time. Uh, I, anything else, any closing remarks, anything else? Um, this has been fantastic, and thank you. This this has been a great birthday present just to have all of this. This has been fantastic, and looking forward to doing more of these. I'm going to do these at least monthly, and um, I've also got one of the top Primerica RVPs I want to interview, so I want to have that headline, CLU interviews Primerica RVP, and see what happens. Uh, I'd, I'd, love anybody, to see, I'd love to see that. I, I don't think anybody on this call is going to be on that except John. Well, that's good. Hey, John, you go take copious notes for all of us. Would you? Because <laughs> I could care less. No, well, the rec- it's, from the, it's yeah. from the recruit. It's from the recruiting standpoint. That's what's really interesting. It's not you know by yeah. term and invested difference and all that bump, bupkis, but it's 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 how MLMs recruit that fascinates me. I wrote my master's thesis at SC. Um, on multi-level marketing. And that's actually how I got through SC. I was working for my family's business. And I also built a downline for a company called XL Telecommunications. I was at NTC years ago, which was a competitor sort of to XL. So that was a long time ago, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Why don't you bring on a first family life person to go with that? Or (laughs) WFG, yeah. No, I, I wanted the headline, CLU and Primerica. I figured that would be get some people's attention. And... <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted it to be collaborative. I didn't want it to be attacking on either end. So um, anyway, I appreciate everybody being on. Any any last closing thoughts? I think we're good. Um, but thank you so much, John and Tom, for being on. John, that was fantastic. I, I've, we've always chatted it in Messenger and stuff, but uh, this was really, really great. And I'd love to do some more on, on this. Um, I think we got, I, I think we, you know, David, you, you, are a, you are a champion of the industry. There is no question about that. And I think that, the, you know, I believe in the power of the mastermind. And I know Tom does too. There's a huge opportunity here for everybody on the call and everybody in the group, you know, um, 
you know, it, it, it's like, can't, you know, that old expression about, you know, when you have a match and then you light somebody else's match, now you got double the light. Yeah. And this could be change that affects the industry. Breakaway League does a great job. You guys do a better job than we do in uh, wealth building cornerstones and building a community. You do. There's no question about it, right? Um, I got a lot of theories for that, and but I'm going to get yelled at if I say anything about that. Uh, <laughs> but there is there's huge power here. This is this this is something that's got to grow. Wow! Thank you. Well, I'm excited to see how it goes. Really, it's just a huge experiment, and I'll just keep growing it and. Uh, see what happens with it. I just throw it against the wall and see what goes on. Um, but this What's has been fantastic. Around? Fantastic. This has been great. Um, I'm going to make some phone calls now. I'm fired up. I was, you know, I usually don't start working until March. I'm going to start working now. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, don't interrupt the cotton color coded planning. I mean, if you allocated a whole bunch of, of yellow mellow time for you, you know, don't, don't interfere. Uh, hey, don't knock it. I still use it. <laughs> don't knock it. I'm just saying, if you planned your year that way, you know. <laughs> don't. If you look at my book, the, the copyright on the pages are 1990. <laughs> of what, cotton? 1990. No, I, I built my own, but oh, I've been using okay. it for, what, 40 years now? 30 years? Wow. Yeah. I think I'm going to join the Breakaway League, Tom. You, 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 you completely changed my uh, perception. Thank you. Well, my pleasure. My pleasure. All right. Look forward to seeing everybody again on these. This is fun. I enjoy doing this. And, and remember, if you're really, really, really good, you'll give back without any expectation. And yep. that's, that's really what I'm, why I'm doing this, because I think our industry needs help. Because when I joined in 1978, the average insurance person was 57 years old. Do you know what the average age is today, according to LIMRA, of the average life insurance salesperson? 57 years old really so, yeah we need to get more people in this industry and unfortunately i believe they're all being trained wrong or, or inefficiently if you will i think if you could learn how to answer the question what do you do for a living and, and you nail that this job becomes fun because then all the good stuff in your head you can actually share with somebody that's my lesson for the day thanks all for uh for giving me the opportunity to, to dump on you here for almost two hours Cool. Yeah, this was this was fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to be ending this and I'll upload it to YouTube and I'll have to re-review it, find all the links so I can put some links in there so people can get the books and whatever else that was mentioned. So this is fantastic. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. And uh, make it a great day, you guys. Yep. Great.